guys let's all stand up please can you say hi to the person next to you say your name behind you in front of you if you don't know the person can you also say oh, you look so pretty today so handsome today oh my god can you also say like this you look so nice just say like Amen. Let's read the Word of God together. Today we're going to read Ephesians 2, verse 4. I'm going to count to three and let's read together. Amen. One, two, three. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us upon with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. That's so hard for me reading English, but anyways, amen. God is good. Amen. Can you say God is good? God is good. I am safe. I am happy. I have life. I have purpose. Amen. Amen. So let's let's worship Jesus in this beautiful morning. Search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise, man's empty praise, and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, then you came along, and put me back together.
God all the glory everybody let's give God all the glory uh, before you before you get too comfortable say hi to people next to you behind you in front of you give a smile and you may be seated everybody and thank you so much I just want to welcome you all to um, to aim uh, service and um, I do hope that you feel that this is home, right? I do hope you feel that this is home, and I think, like for for example, for for us international people, you know, we we come from churches back home, but at the same time, you know, I just want to encourage you: don't feel guilty in being comfortable here. Because sometimes, you know, like, where do I belong? Where do I belong? We belong in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So where God's people are, that is family. Amen? So if, if this is your first time coming here, uh, you are most welcome. And uh, usually after service, uh, we, 
go up to the second floor for coffees and snacks and uh, and also there is a room for first time visitors and we have a wonderful team that will look after you. Um, but you know, I want you to feel at home, you know, and, uh, and so also we would like to know who you are. Please come and say hi to myself, Pastor Lou and Pastor Joe. Uh, we would love to know um, who you are, amen. amen. And uh, I've got just quick short announcements. Um, so, there will be a SIM joint Easter service um, as well. Um, so that will be at uh, 3 p.m. Um, at the main church. Um, so this is the Easter Sunday, right, the Easter Sunday at 3 p.m. So we will be at, again, the Sionro main auditorium on the second floor. Not, not be, so it will be the main auditorium. Um, so please, please, please do come. And, um, and join us. And also, we have a Good Friday service um, on the, um, that will be um, the, I think, the 29th, March 29th. Um, that will be at the Siongno main service, but um, down in B2. There is a service hall down in B2. So remember, um, basically, the Easter will be like Friday, Good, uh, good uh, Easter Friday, B2. And then, because then Sunday's resurrection, we go up to the second floor. <laughs> okay, so we, we're following the Bible because we're biblical people. Amen. Amen. From grave to glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, all right, next, uh, all right, we have um, legal counseling for those um, uh, who need legal counseling, the legal counseling at 3 p.m. Um, in room 701, that's on the, sec on the seventh floor. Uh, I think it should be the first room on your right. Um, now on the first, on that floor, obviously, those of you who are in the March community groups, um, 703, and I will be in room 704 for those who either want to have a chat or perhaps you have questions about Christianity. So I'll be there. Um, so um, p please come. I don't want to sit there by myself. <laughs> it, it's sad. <laughs> All right, so come with your questions and um, we have a wonderful time together. Um, now also, uh, this is also a, just a very important announcement. There are people who's like today is their final Sunday. Either they'll be going back home. Um, so, so is Mari, who's helping us with the coffee. Um, um, so this is our last Sunday here. And also Joseph, um, who um, has been uh, serving in the media. I mean, they really have been fantastic. Um, AIM cannot really function well without the love and service of our volunteers, and you know, it's sad when we have people leaving, uh, but we also encourage that wherever they will go, they will continue to be the light of Christ. Um, so after service, um, we will pray um, at right here um, at the bottom. So um, I think um, also if you'd like to stay behind, also to pray for them, and I think it will be greatly appreciated. Amen. All right, and so uh, we're going to go into offering, and so we have the online uh, offering um, information up here on the screen, and so you can even right now, you can even think and pray and start doing online um, offerings, and um, also I will pray for the offering and for today's word. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness, and we thank you so much uh, for your grace in our lives, and we want to thank you that we, you've given us not only the heart, but also the means of giving. But Lord, we're also thinking for those who are in need. We pray that um, through this ministry that we'll be able to touch many lives and to encourage even people um, who so need um, your help. And we pray, Lord, that even through us, many lives will be changed. We pray for today's word. We pray that you give us your heart, the heart of, um, of receiving your word, Lord, that 
we will not be just hearers, but the doers of your word. We pray, Lord, for Pastor Lou. We pray that you, that you speak through him, Lord, that through the words of this morning, we will be encouraged, we will be taught, but above all, we will know of your grace and your love in our lives. We just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Gabe. Uh, I hold the microphone a little closer to my mouth than he does, so Junkslin, you may need to adjust this. <laughs> it sounds pretty loud up here. Uh, it's great to see all of you here this morning. Um, uh, pa uh, Pastor Gabe uh, referenced, you know, talked about new people coming, and I'm just so grateful. I met some of you uh, before the service started. Uh, but also, for those of you who, you know, you've been coming, or maybe this is your first time and you want to join AIM, the next step would be the new members class, and that's going to start on April 7th, and that's on the seventh floor in uh, room 703. Pastor Gabe's class is in 704, so new members is in 703, and that starts at 1 o'clock. So just, uh, you know, if this is, you're praying and saying, God, is this where you have me to place to belong? Uh, then this is the great next step for you. So two Sundays ago, uh, well, last Sunday I was uh, out at, uh, up in Seoul uh, preaching at Ark Seoul Church there, and uh, it was just wonderful to be there. Uh, so for, for those of you who've been here for a while, you know that I think maybe six or seven months ago, we sent a church uh, out up into Seoul, and that church is doing really well. It was just such a blessing to be there, meet those folks. And so uh, I gave them our greetings, as I'm sure Pastor Joe and Pastor Gabe did when they were up there. But Pastor G1, who's leading that church there, uh, they just had a baby, and so the baby's doing well. Uh, Janice, his wife, is doing well, and so... Just it's just been great. It was great to to see them. Also, just an update on me. Uh, so some of you know, many of you know that I, I started a new job, a uh, new career at 66 years old, and uh, so I became a, a professor at Busan University of Foreign Studies. And so my I had fir my first two weeks of class, uh, I finished, and I have to tell you, it is just amazing. I'm I could not be happier or more blessed to be doing that, what I'm doing. And so teaching, uh, understanding Christianity and teaching introduction to the Bible at Busan University of Foreign Studies. And it, it was so great. I, I, when I uh, first started the class, the Christianity class, I was you know, going through what a Christian is and so forth. And, and I asked them, I said, how many of you are Christians? So was, I think there was probably about 15 or so in the class. And four, four of the students raised their hands. And I thought, oh, Lord, may it be that at the end of this class, every one of them raised their hands, that they are come to know Jesus Christ. Uh, my Bible class uh, is incredible. There's about 20 students in my Bible class, and we are having a blast in that class. Uh, so again, like uh, I, I have people reading the Bible out loud, and they said to me, this is the first time I've ever read the Bible. Uh, I've had people say, I'm an atheist. I said, great, welcome. I pray that that changes. I didn't say that out loud to them. Uh, but uh, I had another, another student said they were agnostic. And I said, OK, that's, I wonder if you even know what that means. But yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and I've had people ask me, like, is it OK to be in the class? I said, absolutely, it's OK. Uh, at the end of my class last week, uh, the Bible class, one of the students came up and said, because I'm encouraging them to ask questions. Like, you have to ask questions. You have to ask questions. Part of their homework is to bring questions. And, and so this one student came up and said, I'm afraid that my questions might disrespect Christians uh, because I'm not a Christian. And, and, you know, I guess he's thinking he has hard questions. To ask, and I said, he, she said, so he said, can I ask those questions? I said, absolutely. He said, really? I said, yes, of course, you have to ask the questions. And so we're just having a lot of fun there. 
So thank you for praying for me. Keep praying and pray for the students, please, that God moves uh, in their hearts. I've also, we started a little group because we're gonna, I'm going to start an English chapel there. And so I started meeting with a, a core group there. So Naomi, Naomi, are you here today in the back there? Naomi's part of that group. And Patrick, are you here? Patrick is here right back there. Thanks, brother, for being there. And two of my students have joined uh, the uh, core team. And so we're just going to continue to fellowship and meet together. And then we're going to launch an uh, a English chapel in uh at Busan University of Foreign Studies, so I can't wait. All right, so we're in our series, uh, Following the King. Uh, we're, this is our journey through the book of Mark, such a significant book in the Bible, such a significant gospel uh, for us, so I'm so excited that we're going through this book. Uh, last week, Pastor Joe led us in mining the truths of this book, so I did the overview two weeks ago, but he started to dig in to the, the scriptures preaching from Mark 1, 1 through 8. And I love how he was connecting Genesis 1, 1 with uh, Mark 1, 1. And one of the things I, I've said here, but also say to my students, is that this book is not 66 books. This book is one book, right? And how many authors are there of this book? One, thank you. There's one author, and it's telling one story and it's about one person. And Pastor Joe connecting Genesis, Old Testament 1-1, with Mark, New Testament 1-1, was just incredible. Uh, and so just, again, just this, this seamlessness of the Bible telling this one story uh, of redemption. And so now we're in uh, the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1 and verses 9 through 13. So you can turn in your Bibles or on your phones uh, to that uh, verse, uh, those verses, Mark 1, 1 through 8. Uh, today we'll get to meet uh, Jesus uh, firsthand. Up to this point, Mark has been talking about him. Uh, today we're going to uh, meet him for, for the first time in this book of Mark. And uh, Mark, from, from now on, we're going to be on this journey with Jesus as he's walking and uh, throughout the three years that he had conducted his ministry. And of course, we, if you've read the Gospels, you know where this all ends. It ends with his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so that's the journey that we're on. And so with that, let's read Mark 1, uh, verses 9 through 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased." And then verse 12, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, Father, we do pray that you watch over your word and that you work it into our hearts that we may know you more, that we may be changed by you, Lord, that we may encounter you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So right here in these verses, we see the Trinity, right? So we see Jesus coming to John to be baptized. We see the Father saying, this is my beloved Son. Uh, we see the Spirit of God, uh, the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus, and we see the Spirit uh, driving Jesus into the wilderness. And so right here in these verses, we see the Trinity, one God, three persons. Uh, so we could, do, we could preach a whole message or a series on the Trinity. I'm not going to do that now. But God is one, but in three persons. Not three gods, one God, three persons. It's a mystery to us. Now, Jesus was about uh, 30 years old when he was baptized, and two events happened before he began his public ministry. So his baptism by John, 
and then his temptation uh, by Satan in the wilderness. So before he started his ministry, these, he experienced these two things. And so why did he experience these two things? What was the purpose of this? And there are at least three reasons. There's probably more. Uh, we're going to look at two of them. But the three reasons, one is to become per the perfectly righteous human. And so we'll see that in a minute. So to become the perfectly righteous human. And then uh, number two, to know what it is to be human firsthand. So to be the perfectly righteous human, to also to know what it is to be human firsthand, and then to show us what it looks like to live a righteous life. Now, I'm not going to talk about that one. So Jesus showing us what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. Jesus showing us what it looks like to live a righteous life. You know, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? Uh, have you ever heard of that before? Nobody has heard that before? WWJD? Raise your hand if you've heard it. Okay, so some of you haven't heard it. WWJD, it was a long time ago. There was a campaign. They had these orange bracelets, you know. Maybe some of you wore them. Uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And the Gospels does, you know, it shows, uh, through the, the Gospels, Jesus, we see Jesus, how he confronts suffering, how he confronts evil, you know, and there is a, there's something valid to what would Jesus do. However, I'm not going to talk about those things. And I also want to say that that's not the most important thing in the Gospels. <laughs> the most important thing in the Gospels is not what would Jesus do, WWJD. The most important things in the Gospel is WDJD, what did Jesus do <laughs> and what he did for us? And so that's what we're going to really focus on is what did he do uh, for us? So number one is he encountered these things, the baptism and the temptation in the wilderness, to become the perfectly righteous human. So Jesus is the only human to ever live a perfect life. Amen? Amen. And so we see that here. So he, he uh, was baptized by John. He went into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. He did it to fulfill all righteousness. Now, Mark is a very concise gospel. It's short and it's dense. And here we are just in the you know, verses not, you know, chapter 1, verses 9 uh, through 13. And we're already seeing Jesus in his ministry, whereas, you know, Matthew and Luke, the, the, these are the three Gospels that harmonize, uh, Matthew and Luke, it's not until chapter 4 that we get to that. So Mark is very concise, it's very condensed, uh, and Matthew and, and Luke help us to fill, and John as well, help us to fill in some of the blanks that uh, we get when we read uh, the book of Mark. Now, that doesn't mean that it, there's anything wrong with the book of Mark. It, no, I mean, not at all. Uh, and then there's something about, you know, the conciseness of Mark that is very impactful. And so he just hits you, you know, one, two, one, two, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's how we get, get it in Mark. But, but Mark is like an empty coloring book page, right? Have you ever seen an empty coloring book page? It's just the white page and the you know, the outline, and then our, you know, our role is to color in, you know, the blank space, right, and make, make uh, this beautiful picture. And, and so that's what Mark is like, an empty coloring book page. And so we get the contours and the outlines, we get the things that are important, you know, uh, in the book of Mark, but, but Matthew and Luke help us, you know, they color in some of the, the blank spaces. And so I think it's helpful for us to look at Matthew, and particularly uh, recounting Jesus' uh, baptism. And so I want to uh, look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. This is where Matthew, he fills in some of uh, what Mark has left out. So then it says this, Then Jesus came to Galilee, to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. And then John says, uh, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? 
But Jesus answered, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. So then John did baptize Jesus. So Jesus had to identify himself with sinful humanity. And he did that. Of course, he did it without sin and without sinning. But he identified with sinful humanity. And he did that. We see that in his baptism. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, right? So a baptism of repentance is that, you know, you're living your life this way, and then through uh, God's work in your life, you, you see the truth and the error of living your life that way, and then you turn to live your life a different way. That's what repentance is. And so John was uh, baptizing with a baptism of repentance, but, but here's Jesus now coming to, uh, to John and being baptized. Did, did Jesus need to repent? No, he didn't. But he did it. He submitted himself to it so that he could fulfill all righteousness, so that he could be that righteous human that righteous human that we all need. So Jesus' obedience to God is affirmed and it's sustained in the wilderness. The precise place, and this is, this is important, but the precise place where Israel's rebellion had brought death and separation from God, and he did that in order that the new Israel of God may be brought forward. So where... Israel failed in the wilderness. Here was Jesus in the wilderness, and he's not failing. And so he's, he's submitting himself to the will of God, obeying God completely. He is fulfilling righteousness. So why is that important to us? Why is it important? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says this, for our sake, he made him, so God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this verse right here is specifically talking about on the cross when all of mankind's sin, all of God's people, their sin was placed upon Jesus. As he's hanging on the cross, right? Darkness covers the land. This is Good Friday. And all of God's people's sin is placed upon Jesus. And so that's the verse he's talking there. But this righteousness of God is more than that. It's the life that Jesus lives. So you may have heard us say before, uh, you know, that Jesus came to earth, right? So God came to earth and that's Christmas, and then he lived a perfect life. He lived the life that we could not live. This is part of that living the life that we could not live, this righteous life. So really important to us. It's an important piece of the gospel. And also, Jesus endured the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. He perfectly obeyed God, and he perfectly rejected the lies of Satan perfectly. He is fulfilling all righteousness. So where, where Satan is tempting him, and we'll get into that uh, in a little bit, but uh, the specific ways, but where, where Satan is tempting him, Jesus perfectly rejects Satan. This is not what happened in the garden, right? Where Satan is tempting Adam and Eve, and what happened to them? They fail. Here, Satan comes again. Same battle strategy that Satan has. Same tactics Satan has is to lie. To lie, uh, that's, that's what he does. He's a liar. And, and that's his strategy, is to lie. And so here's, here's uh, Satan lying to Jesus. And Jesus perfectly, completely rejecting him and obeying 
and submitting himself to God. So Jesus endured the temptation of Satan in the wilderness uh, where Adam and Eve failed to resist the temptation of Satan. So Jesus did what humanity couldn't do, right? This is really important to get. And then if you have any questions afterwards, come and see me, okay? I'm not going to give you homework. That I'm not in professor mode. But, uh, but I, however, it was, talk to me afterwards, because this is really important. This is a part of the gospel that we can lose our grip on. This part that Jesus lived the life that we could not live. He submitted himself to baptism perfectly. He rejected the lies of Satan perfectly. He lived the life that we could never live. And why is this important? The reason it's important is because as humans, uh, we are susceptible to the lies of the enemy, right? Uh, I've been lied to by the enemy. I have bought the lies of the enemy. I have... I have sunken into that darkness, right? And, and by the mercy of God, opened my eyes to it that I may repent, be forgiven, and turn away. But it happens, right? The world, the lure of the world just pulling you. The greed and, and so forth. Jesus perfectly, perfectly rejecting those temptations. And we, we cannot lose our grip on this. And that's why I think that the two aspects of our walk with God is that we have union with God, right? There's this union, and then there's communion. We have this relationship with God. And where, where we fail and when we fail, and look, this is, this is really important. I don't know what it is. I think the older I get, the more I, I desire authenticity. <laughs> the older I get, the more I desire that we just be real, <laughs> right? Just be, be real about the struggles that we have in our life. Be real about the temptations that we face, right? And I think that's you know, part of why we have community groups and, and meet in small groups is so that we can Trust people that God has put us with, and we can be real about our lives and talk about real things in our life. And, and here's the thing, is that uh, the danger is that we think that if we do that, then somehow our relationship with God would be damaged. And that couldn't be further from the truth. God brings us together in, in a family. God puts us together, even as Pastor Gabe was talking about, you know, this family that he's given to us so we could be real with one another. And, and, and so this communion, we have to separate these two things. One is, is that if you have given into temptation, right, if you have given into this, you know, the desires of the flesh, if you've given into this, the cravings of the world, right? And you're sitting here and, and you're aware of that. Like, I haven't, I haven't turned away from this. I'm engaging in this. You know, I want to encourage you, be real about that. First, be real with yourself and don't kid yourself, but be real about this because, and this, again, we can't lose sight of this, is that there's a difference between union and communion. I use the example of uh, my marriage, you know, uh, and you've heard this before, but I, oh my gosh, do we, we have to get this. <laughs> Here's the danger if we don't get it. We will just become legalists. We will just become those who, who, who have to perform to receive God's mercy and grace. How horrible is that? There's a whole book called Galatians, written about that. <laughs> so on September 9th, 1979, at 3.30 in the afternoon, I became Lisa's husband, right? I was, Lisa and I were joined together, and that became our union, right? And so, uh, and, and the, the, the minister said, I pronounce you husband and wife. 
And at that moment, we became one. We, we have this union in marriage. And then from uh, September 9th, 1979, at 3.30 in the afternoon, I have lived trying to be the husband that God wants me to be. And even to this day, now almost 45 years later, I am still trying to be the husband that God calls me to be. Now, in those times when I failed and our communion was broken, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, we're not talking to each other. <laughs> or maybe we're angry, you know, at each other, right? That happens. And our communion is broken, our relationship is broken. But I don't stop being her husband. So here's the thing that's important about union and communion. On the day that you uh, turned from your sins and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, right? On the day that you became a Christian, you were declared righteous. That's what you were declared. That's who you are. Who are you? I am righteous in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This is what this passage is about. <laughs> it's about Jesus doing something we could never do. Obey God perfectly. And he did it for us. He, he did it for himself as well. But he did it for us. He lived the life we could never live. He rejected the lies of the devil in a way that we never could. Now, in those times when our communion with God is broken because of, you know, sin or other, you know, doubt, that communion with God is, is broken, this is the hope that we have. This is the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is secure. Amen? And this is why we can be honest with one another. Because it doesn't have to do with our righteousness being secure or not secure. We're becoming what we were declared. We're becoming righteous. Every one of us is on this journey to becoming righteous. And that's not going to happen fully until the day you die or until the day Jesus returns and we see him face to face. It is only then that we will not be shackled and tempted and burdened by the sin that dwells within us, the lies of the enemy and the, the lure of the world. So Jesus did what we could not do. Jesus did what Adam and Eve could not do. He perfectly obeyed the Father. He perfectly rejected Satan, as we see that in, the, um, in our passage in the wilderness. So the other reason that Jesus did this was not just to fulfill all righteousness, but also he did this to become to know what it is to live as a human. So in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. All right, so let, let's just sit with that for a moment. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? But we have one who in every respect, in every respect, has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Amen? Jesus knows what it is to be tempted. Jesus knows what it is to uh, have this, um, you know, uh, lies, these lies. And then he knows what we experience. And that's the title of the sermon is he knows. And he knows in a way that 
we can't just say, oh, yeah, well, he knows because he's God and he knows everything, right? It's not that. He knows in the sense that he experienced it as well. Uh, back in the early 90s, uh, Lisa, my wife, uh, was um, very, very, very sick. And she was bedridden. And, uh, and so obviously massively concerned about this and trying to find answers for why is she so sick. She had tachycardia, which is rapid heartbeat. So her heartbeat would, her heart would beat like 180, 185 beats uh, a minute, which that, it shouldn't beat that fast. You know, your heart should beat somewhere around 50 or so. 180 to 190 beats a minute. It was horrible. I mean, she, she, had, she was weak. She couldn't get out of bed. And, and if you know my wife, this is very uncharacteristic of her. Uh, she can muscle through anything, but she couldn't muscle through this. And so taking her to doctors and so forth, and then uh, finally, I won't get into all the details, by God's grace, uh, we found out about this illness called Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is a disease that you get from a tiny little tick, like the, like the, the size of a period on a, on a piece of paper. That's how small the tick was. And so we found out about this, uh, and, and so there was a specialist out in East Hampton. We were living on Long Island at the time. Um, and so we called and we made an appointment, and it was, um, we had to wait two weeks for the appointment. She's bedridden. And so I'm sitting with her, and she's just getting weaker and weaker. And I said, there's no way. There's no way we can wait two weeks. So I called the office. I said, there's no way that we can wait two weeks. I don't know if she's going to make it in two weeks. I said, well, I'm sorry. We, you take her to the emergency room, and we know the emergency room was not going to help at all. We had been there many times. And I said, I'm sorry, but we just can't see you right now. I said, okay. I hung up the phone. I said, come on, let's go. We're going there. And I put her in the car. I could hardly get her in the car. She lay down in the back, and I drove an hour and a half or an hour you know, to East Hampton, and I helped her into the office. I sat her down in the waiting room, and I walked over to the, you know, the reception, had the glass thing there, and I opened the glass door, and I said, um, this is Lisa Gallo. She has an appointment in two weeks, but we can't wait two weeks. Oh, we talked to you on the phone. I said, right, we're here now. And she goes, you can't be here right now. I said, well, we are. So uh, we have to see the doctor. She goes, I'm sorry, but you can't. I said, okay, well, we're going to sit here. She said, well, I'm going to call the police. I said, fine, call the police. We're sitting here. So we sat down, and, you know, my wife is sitting there. She had to have glasses on because the light sensitivity, her brain was swollen is what we found out later. And uh, as we were sitting there, the doctor came out, and he looked down, and he's like, you could see them talking, can hear them. And, uh, and you know, she's, the receptionist is like, you know, all this. I don't know what she was saying. Probably, I don't know what to do with these people. They won't leave, you know. And uh, so he looked out, and, and Lisa took her glasses and put them down a little bit just to look at them and then put them back up. And, and he said, okay. He came, opened the door, and he walked us into a waiting room. He said, I can't see you to the end of the day, but you just stay here. And he turned the lights off. She's like, wow, how did he know to turn the lights off? And so then at the end of the day, he came in, and he, he saw her, and he, and he said, thank God you brought her. She probably wouldn't have made it. So he's, he's talking to us, and Lisa asked him, you know, how, how did you know to turn the lights off? He said, because I had Lyme disease. Her doctor had Lyme disease. Her doctor knew what she was going through. He knew firsthand what she was going through. And he helped her by the grace of God, by praise the name of Jesus, helped her get to a place of better health and then 
again, just by the, and we, you know, it's a whole, there's a lot to talk. We could write a book just about that. But he knew. He knew. Because he went through it. When we read this, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. When we read about Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, perfectly rejecting the lies, still at the same time it was real temptation. This is not fake temptation. He really did resist the devil. He really experienced what it was to be tempted. So when we experience temptation, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with those temptations because he endured them as well. Amen? You got to get this also. Not only did he do it perfectly so that we could be clothed with that righteous life, but he did it perfectly because he knew we were going to be tempted and there were going to be times we were going to fail and maybe fail over and over and over again. He knows. <laughs> Amen? Amen? He knows. He knows your anxiety. He knows your fear. He knows your pride. He knows your ego. He knows your greed. He knows all those things because he too was tempted. Let's not lose sight of that either. He did what we couldn't do. And then he is there for us as our high priest who knows. <laughs> when we go to him with our failures, he knows. <laughs> Amen? He knows. Not just in some godlike way, which is true. He's God. He does know in the godlike way. He knows in the human type way as well. Now, he was tempted. I'm not going to go through all these, so um, thank you. Uh, and, and I'd like the praise team to come up. Thank you, media team, for preparing all the slides that I'm not going to go through right now. Um, the question that I have for us is, how well do we know <laughs> what I'm talking about here? How well do we know that there's no way for us to live a perfect life. How well do you know that? I'm not saying that you stop pursuing righteousness, but how well do you know that you will never be righteous in and of yourself? That's not a reason to toss holiness aside. <laughs> no, the command is to be holy. <laughs> as your heavenly Father is holy. That's the command. And I see that as the goal, right? I want to live my life growing in holiness because that's the goal. Will I achieve it? Not until I see Jesus face to face will I achieve it. Will I have victory? Amen. By the power of the Spirit of God, the Word working in my life, by my brothers and sisters encouraging me, yes, I will grow. And I implore you, I urge you to grow, but don't lose sight of the fact of what he has done for us in becoming the righteous human that we can never be and in knowing what it is 
to experience temptation. So my question is, do you need to come to Jesus? <laughs> Maybe you, you need to come to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you need to come to Jesus for the 1,000th and first time. My urge to you is come to Jesus. Let's all stand as we sing this. given into the lures of the world. You've succumbed to the sin that, that is inside of us. And you're here and 
Maybe when you walked in, you said, I don't even know why I'm here. This is why you're here. Because <laughs> he's calling you back to himself. He's faithful. With all that I've been through in my life, Lisa's illness, so many, many other just so many difficult trials. Standing here today, March 17, 2024, looking back over my life, I can say this. All my life, you've been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good. And with every breath I'm able, I want to sing of the goodness of God. And this is the time to turn now and, and turn to Jesus. Turn away from the futility. Turn away from the maybe the anger, the bitterness. Turn away from it because he's there. <laughs> he's faithful. Even when we're not faithful, he's faithful. Turn to him and sing this. All my life, you've been faithful. You've been there. Amen. But Father, I pray right now for my brothers and sisters. For those who are turning, even right now, confessing. Even right now, confessing their doubt, their unbelief. They're confessing their sin. They're confessing their uh, striving to be perfect. We know this, you hear from heaven. And we also know this, you, you know. <laughs> Strengthen them, bless them, make your face to shine upon them, grant them peace. Grant them the peace that surpasses understanding. And may that peace guard their hearts and their minds, O oh Lord. Restore them and restore to them the joy of their salvation, O oh God. I ask this in your precious Son's name, in the name of Jesus. Now receive this, this benediction. May the one who lived the life that you could never live, may the one who knows what it is to be tempted, may he strengthen you, may he encourage you, may he grant you peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, and may you go from this place and shine like bright lights in the midst of darkness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.